Any, any quick reactions? First of all, for people who are from the India, Pakistan, that part of the world, how authentic do you think this picturization was? Pardon? It was pretty accurate? Well, I think it's in typical Hollywood, Bollywood style. Some things are accurate and some things are not accurate, but that's part of life. That's what film industry and TV industry do in order to emphasize a point. But what is the main point being conveyed through this, through this video clip? Why is there a sense of a, uh, shock on the face of the first person when he learns that this person who's going to take care of these pop-ups is actually based in a different country? What was the reason for it? Any thoughts, any reactions? Yeah? The opportunity to work with a physical person if you have a problem with your computer or device is becoming more and more scarce. Right. So the general way is if you had a computer program or a computer problem at the point at which this video clip was made, you expected to deal with somebody who was in your building or close by in a different place. And he at least showed as if he was totally surprised that this work was actually going to be done in a different country. Anything else that you'd have an observation about? Any other reaction, any other thought which came to your mind? Yeah? Uh, they were surprised that someone over the phone actually could fix a computer program where quite often those phone calls could result in, I can't help you. Or so the point being made here is that the ability to fix it at a distance for something which was traditionally done face to face, the the normal answer is, hey, it cannot be fixed or we cannot do it. And he was a skeptical in some ways that whether it can be fixed at a distance and how well it could be fixed. So that was the other concern which was there. That, uh, And this is very a realistic kind of thing. I, mean, I remember when I came to this country, I came to this country in 79. And um, I was visiting one of the big banks here in New York. And I was talking to the a senior person in that bank, senior vice president. And I mooted the idea of uh, doing the software development in a so foreign country in Asia. I did not take India by name at that point. And at that time, I was just completing my MBA. I was completing my PhD. My, I had come from MIT. And the person listens to me. And this is the second line of the discussion which took place within, within, within a couple of sentences. And he says, you must be totally crazy. That was the reaction he gave me in 79. And he said, when I have people here doing the software development work who are right here in the city, there's so much glitches which take place between the people who want the work to be done and the actual programming. And you are suggesting this should be done at a distance of 7,000 miles. You are totally out of reality. And he added on to say, what a stupid university is giving you a degree because you don't seem to know even the ABCs of software development. That was the way his reaction was in 79. Now, I persisted the same year that particular company actually set up a software development facility in India that turned out to be very successful. But initially, there's always a skepticism when you have a new idea which is different from what you've traditionally done before. And we are going to see several examples of that as we go through the discussion today. But let's first take some more thoughts from the audience. What other thoughts do you have when you see this video clip? There's several other major issues that you should have noticed as you went through it. And again, you take it for granted today, but think of it at the time when the first person is doing this kind of work. What were the kind of issues which came up? Why, why this kind of skepticism is there? Any thoughts, any reactions? And feel free, meaning we are not, uh, uh, meaning we'd like you to uh, uh, feel and um, in any issues, whether it's a technical issue, business issue, legal issue, accounting issue, don't just think of it from a point of view of that particular application. What are the other issues which start coming up when you're doing this kind of work at a distance? And again, this is an open session, so people, both students and staff and faculty, are welcome to participate and ask questions and to give, give the insights. Yeah? Well, there can be cultural you know, differences. And you saw some of the cultural differences when you were there uh, in this script. When he's talking with that Indian lady and uh, he expects to be treated in a certain way. The Indian lady wants to be treated in a certain way. So there are those kind of issues which are also coming up. The way he's responding to the phone calls, he's responding in a very, very informal way. The people there are used to much more formal ways in terms of responding to call center calls. So those are the cultural issues which immediately starts happening. And that is a very major issue when you have work being done at a distance. How do you deal with these issues? How do you reconcile them? 
and in some cases they can be a problem in some cases they can actually be an advantage to do it um, I remember um, I used to have guest lectures in my course come and one of the guest lectures who came in my course he was actually running a health medical record transcription company in India and uh, so he gave the lecture and he's saying All right after this lecture I'm going to fly back from Boston to Delhi he was actually carrying some bagels with him and I asked him why are you taking these bagels and he says I have to show these bagels to people in India and I said what is so unusual why are you taking all the way from Boston to India and he said that in our center every Saturday Sunday morning we have uh, records which come from institutions in the US the way it's done is that the medical facility in the US the doctor is dictating some uh, dictating notes about the interaction with the patient those notes are sent over the internet to the person in India those people take these recordings and transcribe them and as they're transcribing them they have to have a certain knowledge of what this person is speaking about so he says every Saturday morning and every Sunday morning there are a number of people who report bagel injuries in the US now you're familiar with what a bagel injury is anybody all of you have eaten bagels I mean, what do you think is a bagel injury yeah go ahead when cutting a bagel so that you're going to put butter or cream in between instead of cutting the bagel you actually cut your finger that's a bagel injury and that's very common everybody knows it in the emergency rooms that you've come with a bagel injury now bagel is something which is not available in India so those people in India actually started looking at bagel and the closest word they found was bagel which is a bird so they said what is this bird how is this bird causing injuries so he said I'm going to actually take these bagels to India to tell them what a bagel injury is so that they can understand what a bagel injury is another one which was fascinating to me he had a number of really uh, good uh, anecdotes to relate and he said uh, once he was uh, surprised because some of the people came to him to say that um, these people in it, in the US are using really using obscene language and it was a car accident report again from an emergency room and the car accident report basically said that the accident took place it was giving the circumstances in which the accident took place and the, uh, the description said that the car was rear-ended while rubbernecking now again if you did not know the context in which these terms are used here it can you can think of many different meanings for this thing or what happened in the uh, in the vehicle okay so there are a number of examples which have come up and um, again if you're not familiar with the context another one which I think is really fascinating is um, when somebody does not make a car payment in time or a house loan payment in time you get a friendly call from, from a person in a foreign country telling you to make that payment in time reminding you to do it so a number of people who are doing these calls are actually from foreign countries so here is how a discussion goes this person from abroad calls and he says why haven't you made the payment and this guy in the US says I didn't make the payment because I was on the road now what does the word I was on the road mean in the US I'm on a trip. I was on a trip I was traveling I was not there what does the word on the road mean in India or Pakistan or these countries <laughs> on the road means that you've been thrown out of your house you're actually on the road literally because all your possessions have been thrown out in the road so the guy basically starts asking me oh when did you declare bankruptcy and this guy says no I didn't declare bankruptcy and the person is saying well you just said you are on the road and he says yeah I, have, I was on the road but what has that to do with bankruptcy so these are the kind of e even though English is spoken in all these countries the way we use English the way th these connotations are different that makes a lot of impact and therefore once you're trying to deal with issues people in a different country you have to be cognizant of these kinds of issues which come up so that's one clear issue which comes up when things are done across national boundaries and again we'll come back to this issue later in this uh, series to talk further about it but let's turn gears what is it did you think when you saw this particular uh, video clip any other thoughts which came to your mind anybody wants to comment on what the quality of work which is done in these call centers the kind of responses which are there the way he tells the person I'm busy now I can't take your call yeah, well 
yeah, at least you have the courtesy of saying that I'm busy. I, there are times at which the operator has just cut me off because they didn't want to discuss further what was going on, meaning I'm sure all of you have had experiences of varied qualities of call service operations. Some are very efficient, some will help you a lot. With some it's very difficult to do it. Yeah. I had an experience with an airline once which I should r relate to you and I'll leave the name of the airlines out. It's a major airline, uh, really major one. Um, at one point I used to go to India fairly frequently and what I found is that the fares were much lower in India than they were in the US so I used to buy, buy a round trip ticket from India to Boston back to India. So I flew from this airline from India to Boston, it worked fine. And then when I, before I was, could make my return trip, this airline has stopped flying to India. So I called up the airline and I said, I have this ticket, you don't fly anymore, why don't you refund half the ticket amount to me? So they said, no, we can't return your ticket amount to you, you have to come to the uh, airport. So I go to the airport, and at the airport the person says, no, uh, we are not going to refund it to you, what you're supposed to do is now, you should fly from Boston to London on our airline, London to Vienna on our airline, sleep the night at your own cost in Vienna, then we'll put you on another airline from Vienna to Delhi. And I said, I didn't have to sleep the night in Vienna, it's a very expensive city to spend a night, can you refund the money? They said, no, we won't refund the money. So anyway, the discussion went on for 30, 40 minutes, finally, I think just to get rid of me, they said, fine, we'll put it up uh, to our managers, what has to be done. Went on, nothing happened, three, four months passed, I called their number up, I'm told repeatedly that it's been held dead by the Asia operations and the refund operations and the international operations. Nothing happened for almost a year. I'm calling with these call center employees. I asked once, can I speak with, the, with your manager? And the person says to me, no, I'm my own manager. And I said, I did not know that your airline had a lady CEO, meaning I knew it was a male CEO, not a lady CEO, but that's the kind of response I was getting. Finally, a friend of mine said, you're doing absolutely the wrong thing in order to get this refund. My ticket was originally $1,000. Half of it would have been $500. I'm asking for $500. He said, ask your travel agent to find you the cheapest, the costliest one-way fare from Boston to Delhi. It was at that time $1,600. He said, go and file a small claims court case against that airline for $1,600. Nobody from the airline showed up at the hearing before the judge. I got $1,600 plus interest on that amount from the, from the airlines. It came to me by Federal Express. And the next day that airline declared bankruptcy. But I, I do not think I was the one who called the bankruptcy of that airline. <laughs> so I'm just saying that when you don't do face-to-face -face interaction, whether it's done at a distance, sometimes the quality is very good, but sometimes the quality is really bad. And still we are looking for mechanisms, how to deal with these issues, what is the best way to address it. And again, should the government be involved in some of these issues in terms of the quality of care which is rendered? Should it be done totally through market forces? So that's the other issue which just starts coming up in issues like this. In the old days, I would have just gone to the airline's office, sorted it out face to face. But nowadays, they all want to send it to someone else. Who sends it to someone else? So, uh, With the same airline, by the way, I had to go very recently to Washington. Last week only, um, I had to change flight. I spent three and a half hours with that airline just changing my reservation from one flight to another flight. It was so bad and I leave, leave the name of the airline out for this discussion. Okay, any other thoughts which come to your mind when you view this, uh, this video clip? So another thing you should observe is the kind of quality of the employees which is there. Uh, it's a fairly large group of people, some will be more mature, some would be more experienced, some will be young. And again, this is still a struggle about how do we really customize these calls to make it go to the right person in the right flavor so that you get the best service. We are having this issue come up with telemedicine in a big way right now. Companies like Pfizer, for example, they allow you access to telemedicine, they connect you with doctors. And in many cases, you are connected to a doctor in your own state. And again, we are going to, in the lecture that I gave on telemedicine, we are going to deal with some of those issues. What happens when the person is across state boundaries or across national boundaries? What are the advantages and disadvantages of that approach? Now, let me change gears and ask you a different kind of question. What do you think happened that allowed these, this work to be done at a distance? 40 years ago, this work would not have been done at a distance. We started doing it in the last decade. 
it's fairly prevalent today. What are the kinds of changes which took place that allows this work of uh, interacting with the customer service person, getting things fixed on your computers on a remote basis? What what is really going on? What are the uh, what are the forces which have propelled or which have made this possible? Yeah. One is the cheap labor. Now, how does the issue of cheap labor come in in a discussion like this? The cheap labor even existed 40 years ago, but the cheap labor at that time was not used to do this kind of work. Why do you think the cheap labor has come in at this point in time? What are the things? Let's take somebody else who has not spoken so far. Yeah, go ahead. It's not exactly cheap labor. It's basically uh, low-cost skill labor. Low-cost skill labor. But again, I would argue that low-cost skill labor was also available 40 years ago. But 40 years ago, we would have never thought that this work could be done at a distance. What was the creative forces which came in? I'll let me take the student. Yeah. It's because of globalization. Other countries are being aware of the cheap scale labor. So one, one reason, yeah, well, the operative word there is the internet rather than the globalization itself. What would you I was going to say like the advancement of technology. The advancement of technology. And in advance of technology, one of the biggest factors is the advent of the internet. Now, what do you think was the reason that the internet was originally developed? Uh, why don't we take you? What was the reason for the internet to be developed in the first place? To network communications between uh, large groups. To network, the answer is that to network communications between large groups. That is partially true, but that is not the original reason why the internet was developed in the first place. Why was the internet developed in the first place? Let's take from the back. Go ahead. I'm sorry? Because of people's needs. That's also a very broad answer. It is not totally accurate, but it's too broad. Yes. It is a military thing. You're going to say something? Same thing? Military? Okay, why did you elaborate? What was the military basis for it? Why the internet was formulated? No, there's a more d different reason for it. What was the military reason for it? They were creating large databases. No, that was not the large databases. That was not the reason for it. I'm sorry? No, not to have control over the people. No, that was not thought of at that time. Later people may have thought it, but at least at that point, that was not the reason why it was developed. But we all take it for granted. We use it every day. But to think of why it was developed in the first place. Oh, oh. I'm sorry? No, it was not a messaging one either. No. Was it, was it to share like the military specs? No, it was not to share military specs. No. Sharing processing power. No, sharing processing power was also not the reason why the internet was developed in the first place. <laughs> we are all in the computer field. It just shows that some things we just take it for granted. Into this. If I asked this question 10 years ago, everybody in the class would have answered it correctly. We just take it for granted at this point. Go ahead. You're closer to the thing, but it's still not fully accurate. Anybody else wants to make a try? No, it was not to connect computers itself. No, that was not the reason for it. No, it was not a base camp and a headquarters situation. No. <laughs> no, I don't want you to Google. I'm the Google at this point. <laughs> Go ahead. Anybody else? Yes. Don't use Google. I do not. Do not. I want it to be a discussion. Anybody else wants to take a try? What about the shared data? So sort of, but it's still too broad as an answer. Go ahead. No. no. Go ahead. It's the archive data. No, not to archive data. Not to share data. Not to archive data. None of them is the right answer. Go ahead. Is it like a missile defense? You know, sort of. You are coming close to it. Secret services. No, not secret services. Okay. Here is the basis for it. The development of internet was originally sponsored by what is today known as the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Its name has gone back and forth. Sometimes it's called ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency, and sometimes it's called DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. In the 60s, when President Kennedy was the president of the US, John F. Kennedy was the president of the US, he took a person from MIT by the name of Jack Ruina to become the head of Advanced Research Projects Agency. And the concern at that point was because of the Cold War between the US and USSR, 
there may be a situation where the USSR may bomb some place in the US and in the process they may actually bomb the communication site where all the control and command is located. So they wanted to have a totally decentralized system in which there would be no centralized control of any kind, nobody will be the coordinator and even if part of the network failed, the remaining part of the network would still continue to operate. So this was some of the design requirements which were imposed on what was originally called as the ARPANET, Advanced Research Projects Agency Net. So initially only a select organizations were allowed to join it, over time more and more organizations were allowed to join it and then it became DARPANET and only very recently it has been put, an international consortium has been developed through the International Telecommunications Union in, um, in Europe to be the oversight agency for this particular kind of activity. Uh, but, uh, and, US and US, US and UK, by the way, are not members of that consortium, but that's how originally it de was developed for defense applications. And this is an example of defense technology then being used for civilian purposes. Jack Ruina is a very fascinating person. I was very privileged. I was his colleague at MIT. Uh, he and I were colleagues at MIT. And in fact, when he stepped down as the director of the research program on communications policy, I actually succeeded him as the director of the research program on communications policy. He's today a director of MITRE and a number of other organizations. And that's, and he's the one who actually sponsored this first project on internet. What is the other technology besides the internet which, is, which has made it possible? This whole notion of work at a distance. Telephone what about telephone communications? Elaborate on your answer, please. I think 40 years ago, it was, people probably would call so easily. The mm -hmm. communication system, like this particular technology where people can call and it gets routed in the whole mm -hmm. uh, software online. And I think was not there before. Okay. Voice over IP is one of the ones. Yeah. Again, taking my personal example, when I came to this country in 1979, the cost of making a call to India at that point was $4 a minute. That's the way it was done. You went through an operator. If you're lucky, the operator connected you through. Otherwise, you, they said, come and try tomorrow. That You have to go through an operator to do it. Today, the cost has come down to a few seconds, a uh, few cents per, per minute. If you do it in bulk, you actually pay less than a cent per minute. And that's all become possible because of voice over IP or internet telephony. How did internet telephony come into vogue? What was the basis for it? How did it come into existence? Because the amount of data that can be transmitted became large through a carrier. Well, you're answering a different question. You're answering how did it come? But I'm asking the logistics. What were the steps involved in this technology becoming so prevalent? That's what I'm asking. Whereas the mode of uh, transmission is corporate and it was transferred from copper to uh, uh, we, we were using uh, copper for only uh, transmitting voice. Yeah. But the voice to packets could be converted into data packets. Well, what he's saying is that originally we used the copper wires to transmit only voice. Now we are using it to transmit data. Right. But there's another issue to it which is also important, which is the ability to actually convert the voice into data at this point. Because it's not sent as voice anymore. It is sent as data. Signal processing. Right. Signal processing, the ability to encode and decode this thing. So again, I think it's a testimony to people in the computer science and information technology field that we are able to do this kind of conversion back and forth and still retain the authenticity of the quality of the voice, otherwise it would not be possible. When did this technology come into existence, the technology for voice over IP or internet telephony? Any thoughts? All of you are young, so it's not a fair question for you. You would just take it for granted at this point, but this is all a very recent phenomenon. When do you think it came in? 96. I'm sorry? 96. 96. You seem to be very aware of it. How do you remember it so well? You're a telecommunication course. You're a telecommunication course. <laughs> yeah. So this technology is only came in the 90s. It's not an old technology. And uh, any other thoughts you have on what may have happened in it? To give you an example, again, think of it as an entrepreneur. The person who developed it for the first time what kind of issues that a person would have faced in order to introduce voice over IP technology? How would the governments have reacted? How would the telecom companies like AT&T and others have reacted when the technology first came in? 
how do you really develop a network of people in this area? Any thoughts, any feelings? There are a lot of issues in terms of changing the country infrastructure. Speak louder. They had a number of yeah. issues in terms of changing the infrastructure. And their, uh, basically so the, the feeling is that they had a lot of issues in changing the standards for transmission. Now let's go ahead and elaborate on who that they would be in a situation like this. In most countries of the world, except the US at that point in time, the telecommunications carrier was a monopoly of the government. The government alone was in this business. They ran all the telephone wires for you in almost all the countries of the world. When this new innovation came in, what do you think the governments would have reacted? How do you think they would have reacted? The government monopolies. What? They were probably against it. They were against it. Obviously, they'll be against it. They prefer status quo. They, they have a stable business. They are earning a lot of money. Why would they want to have an innovation which would create work for them? What do you think happened in the US? Multiple companies came. Right? Very little at that time. There was still one major monopoly at that time. There was a major monopoly at that time who was dominating. What do you think that uh, company would have done? Would they have encouraged this new technology? Would they have resisted it? What would they have done? If you are running a great business yourself and a new technology comes in, what would you do? You can do one of three things. Either you'll embrace it and say, you're the greatest guy, we want to work with you. Or you'll try to ignore it altogether. Or you'll try to stifle it. What would you do? Stifle it. That is the most obvious and natural reaction for most of us. Individuals, corporations, is the same story. And I can give you a number of examples like this. So in the early 90s, what had happened is that this technology was available in very small fragments. Some people had demonstrated it, but it was not going anywhere. So at a major university in this country, a new consortium was set up called the Internet Telephony Consortium. And the idea of that consortium was to be able to motivate people to use this. And in order to make this uh, consortium work, that consortium drew members from both big companies, the smaller companies, the government agencies, and academia to foster this growth. Okay. And I was the one who played the role in setting up that consortium at MIT, the Internet Telephony Consortium. And I remember when I went to that first meeting and talked to all the members, the big guy who was well entrenched at that guy, and again, we leave the names out, it was a big telecom company, I, won't, I don't want to identify who it was. That person representing the company was opposing everything I was saying. If I would say that the cost of telecommunications is very high, his reaction would be, no, it's not very high. It's high because there's less competition. No, there's not less competition. So finally, I got tired of this whole discussion taking place and I said, if you think this consortium is a bad idea, why don't you leave the room? We will start the consortium with the other members of the, of the group who are here. And his reaction was, no, this consortium is a stupid idea, but if you're still going to start it, I will be the first member to join this consortium because you want to be part of the thing. You want to know what's going on and all. So this is a continuing theme that you'll find with every new disruptive technology which takes place. And this is a disruptive technology, and we're going to talk more about disruptive technology. A disruptive technology means it, it does not allow the status quo to prevail. It comes at the cost of some people losing their jobs and other people getting jobs. And that's the, uh, the uh, phenomena in a number of cases that we are going to take up for discussion. Any questions, any reactions, any thoughts, any rebuttals? Now, this notion that because you're entrenched, because you're doing a great job, is a major impediment to, to adoption of new ideas. Ideas are usually developed by small groups. Ideas really mean something has to break from tradition. And ideas are not easy to promote when the big guy in the street is going to oppose you. I was serving as an advisor to a country in the Caribbean where 40% of the banks had gone bankrupt. And what I found in that country is that the country had no notion of a tax ID number or a social security number. So people were taking loan against the same property from three, four different banks and essentially fleeing the country. 
if the prices went up everybody was very happy if the prices went down they could leave the country that's what was going on so i was brought in to help the country stabilize their economic situation and so we designed the first ever financial information infrastructure for that country i convened a meeting of the presidents of all the banks in that country i was explaining to them how this notion will work and i was explaining to them that if this person takes a loan from another bank your bank will come to know about it so at the end of the discussion one of the presidents of the banks walks up to me and says so you're telling me that in case this person takes a loan from another bank i'll come to know about it and i said yes that's exactly what this system will do and he says is great this is exactly what we need in this country that if this person takes a loan from another bank i'll come to know about it so that i don't give him another loan and then i went on and volunteered additional information it basically said and if you give him a loan other banks will come to know about it and he says absolutely not nobody is ever going to see my information now we all laugh at it but we all indulge in it all the time and what i find is there's an asymmetry of information if you are a powerful company or you are a powerful country you are more likely to indulge in this behavior than if you are a smaller company or a or a less powerful country and i've actually written a paper on this subject in the sloan management review on this asymmetry of information and how it's difficult to change when the dominant player is not willing to change and my favorite example is the measurement system which is used around the world almost every country of the world has adopted the metric system of measurement even britain which was the founder of the british measurement system has adopted the metric system there are three countries of the world who have refused to adopt the metric system what are the three countries of the world who do not who do not use the metric system today yes. united states number 1 refuses to accept metric system what is the second one no it's not canada north korea no it has adopted the metric system china no it has adopted the metric system iran iraq no none of them they've all adopted the metric system iceland no it's adopted the metric system <laughs> make a guess one is in asia and one is in africa i'll give you a clue okay brazil no it has adopted the metric system india huh? panama no it has adopted the metric system libya no it's adopted the metric system Netherlands South Africa Netherlands no adopted the metric system South Africa has adopted the metric system Sudan Sudan has accepted the metric system Philippines has adopted the metric system Ghana Ghana has adopted the metric system Korea Korea has adopted the metric system Japan, Japan has adopted the metric system Hong, Hong Kong has adopted the metric system Australia Australia has adopted the metric system Russia Russia has adopted the metric system Huh Which one Israel has adopted the metric system. Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has adopted the metric system. Afghanistan. Afghanistan has adopted the metric system. Egypt. Egypt has adopted the metric system. <laughs> Thailand. Thailand has adopted the metric system. <laughs> Chile. Chile has adopted the metric system. The two countries are in Africa and Asia. So I'm giving you a little clue so that you don't one is in africa one is in asia there are only three countries of the world at this point in time singapore huh singapore has adopted the metric system nigeria. huh nigeria nigeria has adopted the metric system niger niger has adopted the metric system senegal senegal has adopted the metric system <laughs> <laughs> no it's a it's a country in africa which follows what america does in everything i'll give you another clue mozambique no Ethiopia. Mozambique are very fond memories. I served as an advisor to Mozambique through World Bank, so it's not one of them. <laughs> no, it's not. Liberia. Liberia is not. It has adopted. What? Oh, Liberia. I'm sorry. Liberia is the one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you a clue. It follows everything. <laughs> Thank you. So Asia, sir. Yeah, which is the one in Asia? <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you give the right answer, so you're the favorite one right now. Uh, what? I'm sorry. Guam, you must say we go. Guam, no, no, it's not, it's not Guam. Vietnam. It's a country which does not like either America nor it does like Russia. It doesn't like the developed countries. It doesn't like the third world countries. Korea, Mongolia. No. Yeah. No. 
No? No? You're done. No, Tibet is not a country anymore. China rules it. No, it's not Tibet. I'm huh, sorry? Some people think it differently. No, it does not have a... Uh, it's go, uh, some countries have a more legitimate one, but its government in exile is not recognized by anyone. Even India does not recognize it. The, the, no, it's not Indonesia. Nepal is not. Turkey is not. Thailand. Thailand is not. Uh, Fiji. Fiji is not. Huh? What about the Philippines, Maldives? no. Maldives? No, it's not Maldives. It's a religious country. Huh? It's a real... I'll make it easier to you. Anybody else wants to make any other try? You have made so many tries. Singapore, Singapore no. No. It changed its name few years ago. Burma or Myanmar is the third country which does not accept metric system. And it's really ironical that what the implications of not adopting a global standard are. If you are repairing cars, every, you have to have two sets of wrenches, especially if you are in anywhere in the world. One set of wrenches you use for repairing cars from anywhere in the world, and one set of wrenches you use only for repairing cars from America. Similarly, containers and air, uh, airlines, they have to have two different standards. Everything has to be done in two standards, one for metric system and one for British system. Now, here the person is repairing a lot of cars. Probably the price is not very different. But in France and all, if you try to get an American car repaired, it obviously costs you more because those people have to be equipped with a duplicate set of equipment for everything which has to be done. So again, one of the lessons to learn from this new world is that at times it may be better to swallow your pride and adopt a standard which is used by a lot of people. And if you do not want to adopt such a standard, then there are added costs that you incur in terms of doing business in a global world. That's the lesson to be learned from here. Any thoughts, any reactions? Anybody thinks that being independent, having a different standard is really an asset rather than a liability? Why do they have a different standard? Why do they have a different standard? Why have like, everybody seen why are they not well, there's a lot of history to it. Um, different countries have different standards in Arizona and my summers at MIT in Massachusetts. The way the check would move is that the dealer would give the check to a local bank. At the local bank, it would be read by two different people to make sure it was read properly. Then they would encode it in magnetic ink at the bottom of the check. Then it would go on a truck to the closest branch of the Federal Reserve Board, which for the state of Arizona is actually located in Sacramento, California. Then it would go by an air courier to Boston, then to the lead bank, then to the local bank, and then given to me. The cost to society of processing one check was estimated at $1.25 per check, and 66 billion checks were processed each year at a cost of $88 billion. So we, in my group at MIT, we developed the technology for it being able to read the check. I hold the patent on the thing, the amount, reading the amount field. We demonstrated that the check could be uh, uh, result or it could be settled through the internet. We got a patent for it. I put all the technology for free on the web that anybody in the world can use it because I wanted this technology to be used by industry and industry would still not use it, especially in the US. There was nobody to standardize it. The government didn't want to play the role. The banks didn't want to play it. And above all, the blanks were having the float on the check. So it would take longer for the check to be cleared. They were earning the interest on that amount and they didn't want it to be cleared sooner. This thing, this whole technology was adopted ultimately by the banking industry and by others because of 9-11. It is the only positive outcome of 9-11 that I can think of. Everything else is really unfortunate and really sad. What do you think was the relationship? Why did 9-11 lead to this adoption of this new banking technology? Any thoughts, any reactions? Yeah major banks in major locations like New York and Washington were not operating for a time? No, that's not the real reason. Any other thoughts? Anybody else wants to make a try? Yeah? Aiming to keep track of the flow of money within the country? No, that's also not true. That has become an agenda item later on, but that was not the immediate reason why it happened. Why did the 
Why did 9-11 lead to the adoption of new banking technology by the industry? Any thoughts? I'm sorry? No, it was not a question of tracking. Go ahead. Anybody else wants to make a try? Go ahead. This is not an obscene answer, it's a direct answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very obvious one. What happened after 9-11? All the planes were grounded. I just said that the check had to be flown from, uh, from Sacramento to Boston. How do you fly when there are no planes running? So the whole banking system of the country was collapsing. $50 billion worth of checks were stuck in the banking system. So the federal government passed emergency legislation to say that the image of the check should be used instead of the check. And that's how this new technology got adopted by the industry. So there's nothing like a crisis to make a change. There's nothing like a crisis to force the introduction of new technology or new ideas. And one of the things which we don't have in healthcare industry is, we have a crisis, but we don't have a date on which, if we don't have corrective action, everything will drop that. If we had that, things would be reformed in a number of sectors. Y2K caused it for offshoring to be adopted. 9-11 caused the banking industry to use new technology. And once US adopted it, other countries of the world adopted it too, gradually, and pretty soon too. So that's a major lesson to learn, that crisis is the best time to do innovations, to do change, to introduce new ideas, new uh, thoughts. Any questions, any reactions? So what I'm going to do in subsequent lectures is go more into depth. I've taken so far more the historical perspective, what happened in the past, what's happening now, what's going to happen in the future. And in the future, my contention is that we increasingly use a notion called 24-hour knowledge factory. The idea being that you and I work here from 9 to 5 every day. At the end of our workday, we transfer the work to somebody in Australia or China who works from 9 to 5 in that country. And then the work is transferred to somewhere in Eastern Europe who work from 9 to 5. Everybody working in daytimes of their respective countries. But when we come in the next morning, we feel as if a magic fairy has been working behind the scenes while we were asleep. This is what my con uh, uh, hypothesis is, is that the whole world in many of the professions, not in every one of them, is, g is gradually going to move towards. Go ahead. Uh, you were in the beginning mentioning that uh, you are predicting some sort of a crisis in the services sector. Mm -hmm. so, so I believe there is some technology that you have in mind which, you, uh, which currently is not being employed and which might be employed once the situation is out of hand in the... No. I'm making an assumption on a different way. I'm seeing that in some areas, countries are more willing to collaborate with each other. And in some areas, I'm seeing that the countries are actually going on a confrontation path. And when countries will go on a confrontation path in terms of services, that's where we'll have major problems, where country wants to offer its services to other countries, but does not allow other countries to offer services in that country. And there's a whole, this is not a no, new phenomena, by the way. Anybody here knows why the um, opium war was fought? We have people from China and others. Why was the opium war fought? What was the reason for it? Because the, the British wanted tea and they need to sell something to the Chinese that they value. Opium was an easy product that they could ship over, get them addicted, and continually build up a supply, almost like wage labor, almost like wage slavery, but in this case, the wage is opium. And wh what was the provocation? What did the Chinese do or not do, which upset the they British started, at that? They started banning, uh, they were banning the selling of tea to the English. No, it was not the tea. Silk? <laughs> no, it was not the silk. The no. No. It's a major lesson in history for us to remember what, what, what was the cause of it. You want to volunteer? We have people from China here. <laughs> Any thoughts? Why, why, what was the provocation for the opium war? China was putting restrictions on sale of opium. Okay. And Britain said that China has no right to put restrictions on sale of opium. That was the basis on which that war was fought. What was the irony in the whole logic? Anybody wants to guess what was the irony? There's a big irony in this logic which I just presented. 
Britain is fighting a war with China saying you do not have the right to ban the sale of opium. China banned it. Yeah. Yeah. Britain in the sale of opium was illegal in Britain. So Britain is itself banning it, but it says that other countries do not have the right to ban it. I'm sorry. England's gone to war over a lot of hypocritical things. Like they wouldn't agree with anyone invading their country for any reason whatsoever. Right. So every war, in a sense, is hypocritical. Yeah. In some senses, you can say that every war is hypocritical. And basically, wars are not supposed to decide who's right or wrong. Wars, whoever wins the war gets the right to write history, in a sense, as they used to say. That's basically what is the issue here. So we are seeing a repeat of that same kind of thing taking place in services. And I've actually had guest speakers in my course say that U.S. has the best guns. And because we have the best guns, why are we signing any treaties at all? All the treaties should be one-sided treaties. We should be able to do something, but the reciprocity requirement is not there. And I have people in my class who were so upset, they wanted to almost shoot that person down. But again, I had to tame them down and said, this is a free forum. Everybody has the right to say whatever they feel like. And again, I can see reasons why uh, situations where reciprocity does not always work. But in the norm at this point in many of the international trade agreements has been the basis of reciprocity. And that's why it creates a problem and some countries do not want to have reciprocal obligations. And that's where I think the, issue, the jury is still out. And my unfortunate feeling is that I'm seeing too many of these ideas coming where they can potentially lead to a war at some time in the future. It won't happen immediately, but it could be a repeat of history in that sense. That's just my conjecture. There's some other reasons we'd like to offshoring and we'll, we'll close the discussion with that. I think I took s several of them already. The Y2K and the EC I've already taken. The other ones I'm giving you the hints. The policies of governments in emerging economies led to offshoring. What were the policies in developing countries which led to offshoring? Maybe low trade, trade barriers allowing people to work here. Also being able to, also the need for these governments to pay off loans in the IMF and being able to sell major government resources on the cheap. So there's already the infrastructure there to start sending people. So it's not only sending people over, some of it you didn't have to send people over, but you, the ability to do work, the encouragement to people to do things for foreign countries, for foreign companies, that's what developing countries did. There were policies of governments in developed economies which actually led to a boost in offshoring. What were the policies of developed countries and why should they have policies like that? Labor laws. Labor laws, what about the labor laws? So, the other country also has to follow. No, but I'm talking about what was the policy that the U.S. law did, which promoted offshoring to take place. That would be the way I would ask the question. It's a developed country's policies, not the developing countries. You are, you actually have a clue there. Some of the kind of work which has to be done, because of Occupational Health and Safety Act, cannot be done in the U.S. easily. Therefore, companies, the more tighter system you have for OSHA, for example companies are more motivated to do the work abroad. And an extreme example of it was that when semiconductors were first developed, you had to have people to be able to view them, to test them. And at that time, all this viewing had to be done physically. You had to see each of the semiconductors chips individually. And people who used to spend so much time on this work, they used to go blind in three, four years time. And much of this work was done in other countries where people were hired and they knew that four years from now they'll be without a job or they learned it the hard way that four years later they couldn't do that job anymore. Now sophisticated technology has come. We do the testing almost all of it uh, automatically. That kind of phenomena is not there. But again, that's an example where a policy of the developed country actually is encouraging the work to be done in a foreign country. But what are other policies of developed countries will lead to a boost? Come on, folks. Um, what about treaties with other countries? Treaties with other countries. So if you have a free trade agreement with a country, most of the free trade agreements do not co cover services, but if you had a free trade agreement, 
like in Europe they had, uh, in EC and other countries, that essentially leads to work being done in the in the countries which are less expensive. Yes, that's true. What else? Huh? Foreign direct investment can be a reason. You want companies to invest abroad. Uh, that may be a reason to do it. Taxation might be another reason that your tax policies are such that you give more incentives to work being done abroad. Some con com countries did that at the time. What else? <coughs> You're missing a major one and it's law related, so I'm point looking at you. <laughs> well, um, you have to be, uh, um, if you're an American company and you send your work somewhere, and, and they screwed up. You want to make sure you want to know that you can have some kind of legal recourse yeah. to the courts. Okay. So uh, that's another one. Well, but how does it foster? That discourages offshoring. It doesn't encourage offshoring if you have barriers like that. I'm talking of ones which foster offshoring. This is a more difficult one, and it's generally not well known. In the 90s, the developed countries, U.S. being one of them actually encouraged new policies to be done which put all, which wanted that the whole world would take information technology as a new asset and all countries of the world would remove all their barriers to import of computer technology they would have no customs duty or their custom duties should be removed they should have no import license requirements why would u.s be a party to a deal like that why would did the u.s try to encourage this policy Are available abroad? No, that was not the reason. If they are available abroad, why would they have free trade treaties? In, in, only in this sector, not in every sector of the economy. Why did they want IT to become a, a, a commodity or an industry where there should be free trade? I mean, today's world in terms of IT, what is the impact No. So that's the question. Why would the, in the 90s they do the opposite? Why would they encourage all countries of the world to remove all the barriers? Yeah? It's saying because even though the actual physical products themselves were being manufactured in the US mostly, still the software and a lot was most of the software, it's like operating systems, yeah. processors, and all the business software was being manufactured in the US, so the trade barriers allows for Correct. an export all these things. At that time, think of it not just from a software point of view, which is rightly pointed out, but there was communication equipment which was manufactured the routers, the, all those other things which were coming in. And the feeling was that if these barriers were not there, a lot more exports could take place of this. That's one of the arguments which was given at that time. Ironically, it's the same equipment which was exported abroad, which was then used to produce goods, which had to be imported back or exported back to the US kind. And therefore, when restrictions are put, other countries, and I hear this a lot when I travel around, they, they'll say, when it was convenient to one country, we wanted free trade and we wanted everything to do. Now we want to put restrictions. This is again a replica of having unequal trade treaties or things going more easily in one direction than the other direction. So those are some of the thoughts. And again, when you're in the public policy, you have to think of issues or ramifications, both in the short term and in the long term. In the short term, it may help you. In the long term, it may actually be counterproductive to what you're trying to do. I want to take up an issue which was raised in the first half by somebody talking about low-cost labor and skilled labor and things like that. Uh, who was the one who had made that observation? Several of you had made that observation. You had made that observation and somebody else had also made that observation. Can you elaborate on your thoughts about the skilled labor and the low-cost labor? What did you have in mind when you talked about? I was talking about in terms of globalization. Okay. Theory called theory of complicated advantage. So when a company follows uh, the concept of military, basically the one who came up with the concept of mm -hmm. uh, increasing your profits. Mm -hmm. So when you have a region that has the infrastructure, that has uh, whatever is needed in terms of uh, this, uh, technical know-how and everything, right. every country would, and if the country is uh, basically open to the free trade, mm -hmm. then everyone would focus on uh, trying to run their business from that country or that region with mm -hmm. the people properly in terms of all this. You can take the example of sending an iPhone. Okay. The same job even uh, people in America can do it, but mm -hmm. 
but the, the cost of doing that would be like do one phone would be like one sixty five dollars. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to China, it'd be like hundred for okay. Same. Okay. So, now I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to think about it. In the 15th and 16th century, maybe the 17th century too, suppose agricultural crops had to be cut at a particular place in a city or a region or whatever rural area. What would happen to the wages when the agriculture crops had to be cut in that particular town? Well, there was barter system, but let's assume whatever barter you want to use. Some countries, most of it, Europe and all had currencies at that time. That was the way to do it. But the wages would go up, you would agree, when, when the time of the year when you, you needed labor to do it, correct? Everybody agrees that at that time the wages will go up. And suppose 200 miles from that place, there was no agriculture product, the land was not fertile. What would happen to wages at that place? What? So the, ex the wages would be extremely low at a place where there was nothing work to be done and the wages would go higher at the place where the crops had to be cut. Everybody in sync? Everybody agrees with it? Okay. What would be the next thing which would happen? If the wages are low in one place and 200 miles from that place the wages are much higher, what would happen? So people would start moving from the place where the wages were low to the place where the wages are high and gradually what would happen is that the, these people because they are moving gradually the wages at the place where the wages were high would slash, start slowly coming down and the place which is losing the labor the wages have to start going up because there are fewer people available there to do that work correct this process is called labor arbitrage labor arbitrage meaning the trading of com uh, services or the movement of labor from one place to another so that we have relative stability or le relative equalization of the rates which you incur it would never become perfect because some people would not like to move from the place where they were born or for whatever other reasons. So there will still be some disparity, but the disparity will be much less over time than what happened initially. Okay. Now, in the case of computer services, for example, there was a huge disparity even earlier between the wages which were here and the wages which are in India and other places. Why did this concept of arbitrage not take place in terms of equalization of the wages? And the problem even persists today. Why are the wages for similar services pro being done around the world so different from each other or significantly different from each other? Why do we have this continuing phenomenon? Currency differences. Currency differences is not really the right is not really the right answer because you can convert the currency in today's market on the market itself from one currency to another currency. So the fact that you're using pounds in Europe or England and you're using dollars here is not a reason why the salaries or why the uh, remuneration would be different between England and America, for example. What are the other reasons for it? Standard of living. Standard of living well, I can argue that at the, again, taking the old example, which I just did, that at the place where there's nothing to really do, there's no agriculture, uh, what the name people have a very modest way of living they're living a traditional life therefore they have less things to spend on and therefore because they're spending less that's why their earning power is less and conversely in the place where there's a lot of agriculture product they eat more they drink more and therefore they're it can explain i would argue that the standard of living may be a slight factor but it's not the dominant factor why the wages have to be so different and why they are continuing to be so different in different places for the same kind of skills. Cost of living. Cost of living again is related to the standard of living. Yes, because the cost of living is lower in India, therefore the salaries are lower. Because the cost of living is lower in Vietnam, the salaries are lower. But I would also argue that it's both a, a factor as well as the result. Because people are earning less, they have less to spend. And because they have less to spend, therefore the cost of living in some ways is also lower because there's not. So I, I think it's also a result rather than being a factor a causal factor of sorts. Is it availability of resources? Availability of resources. Well, availability of resources. There's a lot of available resources in India. There's a lot of available resources in Vietnam. Because there's a lot of available resources, yes, the price is low. But that does not explain why those people are not moving to cause this arbitrage 
uh, and equalizing the wages around the world. Yeah. The minimum wage laws and unions. Minimum wage laws and unions is a very interesting thing. If you take bus city bus drivers in many cities in the U.S., their wages are artificially high because historically the, it was a unionized job and they made sure that their wages had to be kept at a certain level so that's one of the reasons to do it and it's very difficult to break through the union system or whatever the government may have guarded as far as minimum wages are concerned so that could be a reason why these wages are high in certain cases some cases it will justify but you're still missing the main issue why these wages are so different in different places of the world it depends on how developed the country is and what is the argument the developed countries are always more expensive yeah. So by that definition, if things are costly in Switzerland, then Switzerland is more developed than its neighboring France or something, just because things are more expensive in Switzerland, by your argument? No, 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 I, I, I'm playing the devil's advocate. I'm asking, I'm provoking you to say, think about it further. None of these answers is truly right or truly wrong. I Meaning there's shades of gray in many of these answers. Yes, when, when you're more developed, yes, you tend to spend more things. Uh, we claim in this country we have the most developed healthcare system and therefore our costs are the highest. But it does not mean that it's considered the best. If you take the statistics of the World Health Organization, we are ranked somewhere between 20th and 60th among the world in terms of the healthcare. So development does not, the costly thing does not necessarily mean it's the best in all cases. It may be the best, it may not be the best. I've just given you a counter example in the American healthcare system, for example. What do you think is the reason for it? Why do we have prevailing differences in wages for the same kind of thing? Why don't we have arbitrage taking place? Why did the arbitrage not take place 30 years ago in the case of computer skills? What is the factor which is there? I'm sorry? Male and female. Uh, I would say within a society it is true, but across societies it's not true. The reason Indians are paid less than Americans is not because of the sex difference. But within India, within the US, I think it's totally true. There, is a, there has been historically a large difference. It's coming down, but it's coming down too slowly in some cases. Yes, I agree with it. Any other reasons that you can think of? Maybe it's because of the division of labor. What, do, what, what factor about the division of labor? Like um, in the, uh, if you were said for in the more developed country, you probably hire one person to do uh, a slew of different jobs, and that's what they were paid for. Mm -hmm. When you go to a less developed area, you just hire one person to take care of one part of a job, mm -hmm. and other persons to fulfill the other roles in that job. So they don't have as much responsibility, and they're not obligated to pay them as much. Well, your example you've taken is a is a valid example. If you take doctors for example, in many countries around the world, you only have general practitioners. You don't have a specialist. And therefore, you certain pay a certain amount, and because the general specialists are substitutable one for the other, the prices are, are low. Whereas if you take a country like America, we have so many specialists, super specialists, and one specialist refers you to another specialist, there's less number of available specialists, and therefore the cost of healthcare may be higher for that reason here than it's in the other places. But I don't think that itself answers the question why the wages of doctors in India is so low versus why the wages of the doctors in the US is higher. Why is the arbitrage not taking place? That part it does not still answer. Go ahead. What about the availability of skilled labor um, like in numbers? Like what? the man manpower numbers? Like what about the availability of skilled numbers? Like if you, if you consider uh, India arena, the number of skilled labor is more than the number of uh, skilled laborers in the United States. Okay. Um, well, number of skilled laborers in Mozambique is very small. Does that mean Mozambique will have very high wages for that reason? Number of skilled laborers in Myanmar is very small. Number of skilled laborers in Liberia is very small. Well, can it depend uh, upon the work, the type of work they do? Again, I don't think it's answering the question, why are people not able to move? Go ahead. Okay, okay hold on, one person at a time. Go ahead. What is the main reason? There is no main reason. Okay, there is a main reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> but okay. but let's start with whatever reason you want to give. We start with the reason. So okay. there is a monetary policy and inflation rates. Okay. Uh, that's one. Okay. And uh, the second part is technology. Okay. When you are able to do, uh, like when there is no arbitrage happening because right now technology is so cheap that you can afford to do anything without arbitrage. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What I'm like, thinking is that because of these uh, strict 
immigration laws? Right. That is the right answer to this question. The reason arbitrage cannot take place is because of the immigration barriers that countries have erected around themselves. That is the real reason. So outsourcing is, an, is the unwanted child of immigration laws. If we did not have immigration laws, we would be able to move freely from one country to another country and the wages will get normalized to a large extent through arbitrage and therefore we will not have this huge disparity between wages around the world. So immigration is the reason why we are seeing all this outsourcing taking place and in the old days you could not have employed a bus driver from India to drive your car here but today with new technologies coming in you can come to a point where the driver may be in another country but would be driving your car here using all the new technologies which have come in. So technology is the mechanism we are using to surmount the immigration barriers that countries have put around themselves. That is the prominent reason for it and people do not realize that it took you so much effort to think about this reason. So if we did not have immigration barriers, we would have people moving it and therefore there would be no outsourcing of services from one country to another. The person who repaired your computer would be here because it would have been more convenient to do it. But, so what we are trying to do is essentially hire a virtual worker in another country pay them the lower wages and do the work which they were supposed to do in this country. That's what we are trying to do through this mechanism of outsourcing and offshoring. But if they immigrate here, then you have to increase the wages for them. What, what will happen is if they are able to immigrate from there to here, the wages here will come down and the wages there will go up. That's what would happen in that case. Yep, yeah, that's already happening. As this process of uh, uh, outsourcing is taking place, the wages in those countries are going up, especially in countries which are doing a lot of outsourced work for other countries. So the wages in those countries will go up. Yeah, go ahead. So if every so if we had this idea of arbitrage, arbitrage where all these all, where all these people are going to where the highest pay is, couldn't the average pay for laborers go down so much and the labor and then capital isn't actually being altered? Is the the money coming from capital can be altered? So there would still be, uh, there'd be even bigger gap between uh, two classes, one of a capital class and one of a labor class. And labor would be so cheap, there'd almost be no reason to work. Well, first of all, uh, I agree with part of your premise, but I don't agree with the other part of your premise. The fact that there will be still diversity, there will still be different classes, I'm agreeing with that. But what I'm disagreeing with you is, that because of the arbitrage, the difference between the two sides will increase further. I agree in a different sense that the digital divide is actually being compounded by the advent of computer technology. The haves are becoming even more prosperous, the have-nots are becoming uh, are even behind. That part I'm agreeing, the diversity among societies is increasing. The people today in some countries do not have access to computers and they'll have even a harder time in entering the world economy than otherwise. But for countries which are techn technologically savvy, and I put in uh, 20, 30 countries in that, in that region. In those countries, what will happen is that people will start earning more money, they will see growth in their cap, uh, resources, and they'll see new capital being generated. Uh, that's what I, I, I will happen in those countries. And unless the capital is being distributed as well as the labor, there are still be those haves and capitals. And absolutely, there will still be haves and have nots, absolutely true. And that's already happening in places where this new development has taken place. If you take countries like Russia, you take countries, the difference between the haves and have-nots is actually increasing. That's absolutely true. Because the capital, the, the benefits of this reduced labor is actually not going to the laborer itself, it's going to the capitalist who's employing that labor. So therefore, if IBM or any other company has people around, we have to th think in, uh, into account all the different segments of the society who are affected. We have to think of it from the employee's point of view. We have to think of it from an employer's point of view. We have to think of it from a local community point of view. You have to think of it from a shareholder's point of view. And the difference or the gains which are accrued to the different constituencies differ by case by case. It's not like everybody wins or everybody loses. That's what happens. I also think that, say, with some countries that give offer a lot in social, in social welfare, say, like uh, some European countries that give free universal health care, with free with, with taking on these, these barriers between immigration, we could just go there and get free health and then come back and just tax that one system you know, very heavily. You? Well, I have several answers to that question. First of all, 
many countries of the world are putting in new barriers to what kind of things people can be eligible for locals versus foreigners kind of it and that trend will actually increase over time the second thing i would argue is that much of the problems which is happening in countries like greece and others is actually a part of the same phenomena which is taking place that those countries had a captive industry they used to manufacture things for the local economy they were giving a lot of benefits as far as healthcare is concerned now when cheaper goods can come in from abroad cheaper services can come in from abroad those people have lost the traditional market of servicing the domestic industry because foreign goods are coming in and that's one of the reasons why this phenomenon is taking place where countries are having problems trying to find what their role is in the new economy okay. yes. transportation costs are added in, you're still manufacturing at such a much lower price. And I can see how moving people over, and I love that, I love the idea that trying to increase the general, uh, uh, everyone's uh, quality of life. But do you think there's, a, there's enough even resources that are being taken advantage of right now to, to give everyone that, uh, a better quality of life? Well, I think the evidence at this point is choppy. Different countries have taken different measures about how to address these kinds of issues which are taking place with globalization. We are all learning in the process. I don't think there's a perfect cure for it. Uh, one of the things which I unfortunately feel is will take place is the same kind of issue which takes, took place in trade or products. Countries in Europe, especially before the First World War, between the First World War and the Second World War, there was a whole advent of trade wars where people had very... Uh, uh, um, restrictive policies they wanted some rules to apply to their products going out other rules to apply for products coming in they did not want reciprocity of these things and those things essentially got led to war, war uh, trade wars was one of the main reasons for the actual wars and I see the same kind of issues coming up in services at this point where countries do not want reciprocity they want to be able to market their services in another country but they do not allow services for other countries to service things in this country for example and I see a whole new trend of trade wars taking place in services which, which is going to happen unfortunately unless the country see uh, 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 take different course of action this is a subject I'm going to cover more about trade wars and the role of the World Trade Organization and the role of it I've actually written fair amount of material in journal papers on it in which I've actually argued that a lot of restrictions put by countries on outsourcing is are actually in violation of the of their obligations to the World Trade Organization that these are actually restrictive practices now so that is still a very emerging thought and I'd love for people to work more on it research more that area I think it's a growing area of, of endeavor any other thoughts any other reactions yeah yeah um, I've been explaining this to at least twice and I somehow still don't understand it. Okay. What exactly is outsourcing? Okay. Good question. Let's start with the audience. What exactly is outsourcing? Yep. Go ahead. I don't know, give your labor to somebody else, like you could outsource your cooking. Yeah, outsourcing of cooking is a very good example. Yes. So how do you describe it in words? What is outsourcing? Any thoughts? He has given a very good example actually of outsourcing. What is outsourcing? Anybody else wants to make a try? Go ahead. I'm giving work which was uh, traditionally done by your organization, a particular organization is now, it starts to be done by somebody who is out of the organization. Okay. Anybody else wants to give views? Yeah. Just have a comment. A lot of people think of when you say outsourcing is done overseas, that's not always true. It's, it in the same town. It could be in the same town, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hiring another organization to Okay. Well, the simplest definition I'd like to give is outsourcing is when you have somebody else do the work for you. So if you do not want to cook your food tonight and you go to a restaurant or you have somebody else cook for you, that is an example of outsourcing. Okay. It could be a different person, it could be a different organization, it could be in the same town, it could be in a different town, it could be in a different state, it could be in a different country. Outsourcing does not specify which place its work is being done. 
what is offshoring outsourcing to another country so you are saying offshoring is outsourcing to a different country anybody else have any different thoughts so a different boundary because outside your own boundary it's not necessary in the country you think offshoring even if i did it from messages from new york to messages that that will be an example of offshoring anybody else have any opinion offshoring actually has a connotation of country so for anything to qualify as offshoring it has to be done in a different country so offshoring basically means having the work being done in a different country okay. now which of this is a is a broader term is outsourcing a broader term or is offshoring a bro bro broader term i'm sorry Outsourcing. outsourcing is broader anybody disagree because <coughs> i mean offshore most of the time they, they think about when they think about offshore it is more basically financial <laughs> like monetary stuff it could be money it could be anything but offshoring because it has to be done in a foreign country whereas outsourcing can be anywhere therefore the contention is that outsourcing is the broader term does everybody agree or does anybody have disagree go ahead Oh, well, you know, let's say Morgan Stanley wanted to keep their IT, IT department in-house, yeah. but maybe move it all over to India. That would be offshore, right? But not outsourcing. Not outsourcing. Correct. That's, That's exactly... That could be bigger. Exactly true. So the thing to realize is that neither term is a subset of the other. I can think of examples which are both outsourcing and offshoring. I can think of examples which are neither outsourcing nor offshoring. I can think of examples which are outsourcing but not offshoring and I can think of examples which are offshoring and not outsourcing. Anybody have difficulty thinking an example which is from any of these four categories which I just mentioned? You all agree the definition? Okay. So a lot of this public outcry or especially what the politicians always make a thing that is actually directed against offshoring not against outsourcing. But they tend to use the word outsourcing, which confuses everyone. Yeah. Okay. Now, offshoring is a recent phenomena, work being done in a different country. You could not have done it in the old days. Why could not you? Why you couldn't have done it in an, in the old days? Communication. Right. Me. If you had to do it in the old days, meaning how could a, a barber from Mexico uh, cut your hair? with the technology of those days how could you go about doing those kinds of things so it was just not possible so offshoring is a new phenomena outsourcing is a is a is a much older phenomena what is the oldest example of outsourcing anybody staff is welcome to participate jonathan you want to say what's the oldest example of outsourcing I suppose the uh, ancient Sumerians outsourced uh, a significant amount of their control. Okay, that's a good example. Anybody else have any even an earlier example? What is the old, old, oldest example of outsourcing? Anybody wants to make a try? Yeah. That's a unique one. I've never heard that example be given by anyone. So I learn something new every day. Bees doing this work uh, among each other and helping each other do it. <laughs> doing the wonderful example. Great, thank you. I learned something new, as I said. Everything that I teach, I've learned from someone else. Everything I write, I've learned from someone else. So again, I thank all of you because I tell people I'm in a unique profession where others do the work and tell me what to do and I get the credit for it. So again, this is an example. Thanks. Anybody else have any suggestion on among human beings, what is the oldest example of outsourcing? You've all heard about it. It's something you, you would have all heard as adults. It, I, I gave you a clue, by the way, just now. What's the oldest example of outsourcing? Oh. Yeah. I was thinking slavery. Slavery comes close. Fairly good. Anybody else wants to make a try? Yeah. Uh, hiring a maid. Hiring a maid. You're coming close to the point. 
Not exactly, but we have come very close to the point. Anybody else wants to make a try? So despite the politicians' rhetoric that outsourcing is a new phenomena, outsourcing has existed for a long time, and I'm asking you to think of the earliest example of it. Huh? Egypt. Egypt? What about Egypt? The workers were not from. There were a lot of workers and they were from. The H1B phenomena <laughs> kind of a thing, people coming from abroad. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. What? You don't want to share it in public? Yeah. Go ahead, say it. It's probably the right answer. That's why you're spoiling <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's, that's why I said it. <laughs> I gave you the hint. Go ahead. Go ahead, say it. That's fine. Go ahead. For a man to have his own child. For a man to have his own child. That's an example of. He needs the woman. The, the, the world's oldest profession is the oldest example of outsourcing. Prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're close. <laughs> okay. So that is the oldest example of outsourcing. <laughs> you didn't think about it. <laughs> That's why I'm inciting you to think about it. Late in the evening, I have to keep your interest. <laughs> okay. I said it else. I gave you so many hints. Should have taken that hints. I should tell you that uh, on an aside, that uh, in the courses when I teach on this subject, I allow the students to write on any topic that they want, as long as it's broadly within the scope of it. Uh, now, some, uh, sometimes people come up with really extreme topics, which I tell them not to write, like religion X in country Y. I thought that's a little too far from outsourcing and things like that. So my students have written on all kinds of topic, and every paper written by my student is available on the web. And they've taken very unusual topic. One of them wrote, uh, she was a lady from China. She wrote it, a paper on outsourcing of my love life, for example. So that's what she wrote about. One of the papers which has been bootlegged a lot, and which is actually the one where my name comes as the su a supervisor, it was a lady from Korea who was a student of mine. And she wrote about the outsourcing of the sex industry in Cuba. That's what she wrote as a paper for the course. And that has become the most heavily downloaded paper of mine, by the way. And I, I don't know whether to take it as a privilege or as a problem that my name gets associated with it. Whereas my role was only of a supervisor. I was not the author. She actually did a fantastic job studying the whole pros and cons and the economics and the social and all the other aspects of that issue. So again, for people taking it as a course, I give them fair flexibility on what to write. And it's a whole thing. And uh, it's really fascinating what, what they've written. Uh, the students sometimes say they, they do not know what to write about. And uh, one of the students came to me and said, I don't know what to write about. And I said, how do you spend your spare time? And he says, I do nothing. And I said, no, you must be doing something. I play video games. So I said, write a paper on outsourcing in the video game industry. And what he wrote is an absolutely fabulous piece of work, which actually got cited at a number of places. One of the other persons wrote a paper on outsourcing in the media industry. And she was an undergraduate. And three months later, she gets an unsolicited message from Australia saying that this is the most authentic piece of work on outsourcing in the media industry. We are actually introducing it in the curriculum in Australia as part of a course. And she got a job at Lionsgate Studio, which is one of the leading Hollywood studios based solely on that paper which she had written. And at the age of 26, she's now working for a venture capital firm, uh, investing in films. Essentially, that whole thing started from the paper that she had written. So again, I uh, invite people to write on things which are unconventional, which are different, and that's what we, really is important to me. Any questions, any comments, anything else? What's Anybody? the name of the course? This is part of the course which we're trying, and I can talk to you offline what, what, how we're trying to do it. This is the experimental part of the course which we're trying to do. Now, there are some other reasons which made outsourcing popular besides the ones which we have dealt with. Uh, these were things which were not planned by anyone. They just happened to happen at a particular time in history. And there are two particular aspects which are extremely important which took place. Uh, one of them took place in the late 90s. The other took place in the... Uh, around 2001, 2002. Any thoughts what these two phenomena were which led to a major boost in outsourcing or offshoring, I should use this term, in offshoring of activities. 
I'm sorry? How do you relate the IT bubble to this? Yeah, it was, but it was not really the IT bubble which led to a major boost in offshoring. Manuel. There were two other phenomena which took place. One was in the 90s, one was in the 2000s. Yeah. 9-11. 9-11. 9-11 has actually contributed to a different kind of thing, which again um, is very interesting in itself. And I'll come back to the 9-11 aspect. But as far as offshoring is concerned, 9-11 was not the reason which led to a major boost in offshoring. What were the two phenomena which took place? Yeah. Office. Why do you think it contributed to offshoring? Yeah, yeah, the technology boost did help, but again, that was not the major phenomena which it gave. Earlier to these two phenomena, companies were not willing to do offshoring. They were, they had major issues. They didn't want work to be done abroad. They didn't want work to go. What were the main two main reasons why companies changed their whole attitude towards offshoring? Hmm? Well, we already covered that. These were these were these were not technology-related issues. These were totally unrelated to technology. These two issues which took place. Yeah. Is one of them a recession? Sort of, but not really. That's not the main reason. Anybody else wants to make a try? If I tell you, you'll think, why didn't I think of it? It's so obvious why it took place. One was in late 90s, and the other is 2001, 2002 kind. In the early, few years later. Come on, what took place in the late 90s, which is so important, which changed the whole world? Y2K. Why did Y2K, what is the relationship between Y2K and offshoring? Anybody who has worked on real life IT projects will realize that IT projects are notorious for taking more time and effort than people thought they would be taking. So usually you go to your manager and say, this problem is much bigger than I thought. I need three more months to do it. In this particular case, whom do you go to to get a three-month extension in deadline? Who do you think would have given you a three-month extension in the deadline for a project like this? So there was nobody available who could give you an extension and therefore you were constrained to change some of your organizational rules. Earlier companies were not willing to let the work go outside the country. They were not willing to let it go outside their companies in many cases. They were not willing to hire foreign workers, but all those things they had to change in order to make sure that the work got done in time for December 31 of 1999. So Y2K made a major impact in the way companies viewed it and opened up to letting foreigners work and letting the work be done abroad. It's just a coincidence, a major event which has changed the whole uh, and the, so this is the event which took place on a global basis. There's something else which took place in Europe in the early 2000s which led to the same phenomena in Europe. What was that in Europe which took place which led to the same phenomena in Europe being repeated? Yeah? Centralizing their currency. Centralizing their currency, absolutely right. Whenever countries have changed their currencies, they've done it over a period of two, three years. They've done it very gradually. Here, a number of countries decided to change it. They changed it in a record time. There was no way for the local labor to be able to do it. And again, they were forced to use foreign workers to do the conversion. They, and it was all around it, whether you were a shop, whether you were a government, whether you were a bank, everybody had to change their system. And that's when they had developed these new things. So Y2K and this European currency have been the ones which really fueled this offshoring phenomena. And once these companies saw that how good these people were in terms of talent, how much money they could save, they continue to use them for other projects as well. If these two events had not taken place, we would have had 10% of the market that we have today for the offshoring area. The, it was a huge multiplier effect which took place. Any questions, any suggestions, any reactions? Now, since one of you mentioned 9-11, I'm tempted to give another example which is not directly related to offshoring but is somewhat related. In this country, a number of segments of the industry work on a state-by-state -state basis. They're regulated at the state level, not at the federal level. We are having this issue with telemedicine. I'll come back to that in a later lecture. But I want to take the banking sector. 
In the banking sector, banks were only allowed to operate in one state in this country. Citibank operated in New York and no other state. Bank of America operated in California and no other state. Now, initially it worked fine. The, the person who gave you the money was in the state, the bank, the person who took the money was in the state, everything worked fine. The first thing which created a problem for this scheme was the introduction of bank checks. A check could be from anywhere in the country. How do you clear it if your bank cannot operate outside the state? So the federal government intervened and said that as if a check is out of state, we will take responsibility for clearing the check for you. So the federal government became the bank or banks kind of a thing. And the process was very cumbersome. If I took my Boston checkbook and gave a check to a dealer in Arizona, and the last eight years I actually spent Many countries adopted the metric system, even Britain adopted it. The Congress here has tried repeatedly to adopt the new standards. It's been stifled. I lived in Arizona for a while. In Arizona, all the roads which go from Tucson south of the border to Mexico, they're actually calibrated in kilometers. And I couldn't believe it. How come they're cal calibrated in kilometers to the border? Why are they not calibrated? And what I was told is that in the 1930s, when the depression took place, they were looking for people to have some work because the government was funding work and they couldn't find any other projects. So one of the projects they funded under the, in the 1930s during the depression era was to convert all the road signs from miles to kilometers. And recently when we had the same problem reoccur when there was not enough jobs, the stimulus package was put forward by the Bush administration and then by the Obama administration. There was a motion that because we are short of jobs, the jobs that people should be put to is to convert those kilometer signs back to miles. Thankfully, it did not get approved, but that is what people were trying, that we should not even embrace anything. The only field in the US which accepts the metric system is the medical industry. The drugs and all are also calibrated in the US in milligrams and grams, but that is the only sector which has accepted international standard. None of the other sectors is willing to accept the international standards. And I personally think it's, it's, a, it's a major disadvantage in today's world to have a standard which is so unique that only Liberia and Myanmar think that they should adopt it, keep it, and nobody else in the world keeps that standard. That's just my feeling on that issue.